in honor and reverence of the gospel of Jesus Christ, hearing from the gospel according to Mark in the first chapter, verses 9 through verse 13. Mark chapter 1, beginning at verse 9. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descended on him like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise Praise Jesus Christ. You may be seated. As we turn back to the beginning, to Genesis, in the ninth chapter, Reading in Genesis chapter 9, verses 8 through 17. Genesis chapter 9, beginning at verse 8. That's just, I think it said that it's on page 9. Yeah, chapter 9 on page 9. That doesn't work too often like that. <laughs> Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. It is for every beast of the earth. I will establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off from by the waters of the flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all generations. I have set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth when I bring clouds over the earth. And the bow is seen in the clouds. I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And the water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is in the earth. God said to Noah, This is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is in the earth. The word of the Lord. Throughout the history, God has, particularly as we think about in the Bible, uh, evident throughout the Bible, God has had a plan And the plan has always been that his people would be in relationship with him. An outworking of salvation. And he's done this through covenants. A covenant is a formal contract of a mutual relationship. And so this morning we see here in Genesis the reference to one of those covenants. Uh, There are actually five major covenants in the Bible, uh, and each of these covenants has a sign that goes along with it of the relationship. We're focusing on this one in Genesis, but then going to participate in another, the last of the covenants um, at the end of the service. But just want to outline these five major covenants. Uh, We think of the the Noahic Covenant, which is the one that we just read. A renewal of God's desire for creation. 
sign the rainbow. In ancient days, in hunting and in battle, the bow was the most potent of weapons. And to hang up the bow meant the end of something. And God has hung up his bow in the sky. The end of his war with people. And a beginning of peace. An establishment of peace. As we continue to look in scripture, there's the Abrahamic covenant. In which God begins the active phase of bringing about salvation. Redemption of people. And the sign was circumcision. Identified the people of Yahweh. Those who were circumcised. Then there's the Sinaitic covenant. Uh, with Moses and the people as they were wandering through from Egypt in the exile. And God provided instructions on how to live as the people of God. The sign was the Sabbath. That worshipers of Yahweh are known by participating in Sabbath. Those who follow the ten words, the ten commandments, will set apart a day, the Sabbath day, to say, we are no longer sovereign. God has given us dominion over the earth and given us responsibility to take care of all these things, but on the Sabbath day, we recognize that there is one more sovereign than ourselves, God. And so we set aside that day to consecrate ourselves to him. Then came the Daviatic covenant, a promise to David that there would be a kingdom, God's kingdom, that would continue, a promise of a Messiah, that there would be a king who would fulfill that kingdom, who would bring about that kingdom in the world. And then, I've never seen this word before, so I, I guess I've made it up, a Christic covenant. The completion of God's covenant relationship with humanity. The sign was the baptism and Eucharist as evidence of what Jesus does on Calvary in his death and resurrection. Forgiveness of sin and life with God. Well, today as we think about just the Noahic covenant, we see that there are seven key principles that God demonstrated in the Noahic covenant. First is that there is a single causative agent. God initiated it. We see in here over and over in this passage that we read, God says, I establish. I will establish. I have established. God is the one who does the covenant. We don't create it. And in fact, the word there, if we were to look at it in Hebrew, uh, means I cause to stand. It's a word of building. There is no relationship with God unless God takes the initiative. And God has said, I cause to stand a relationship with you. I am the one who is building this relationship with you. I love you. I care about you. I want to have a relationship with you, and I am making the way for this relationship. If we think back to the story of Noah, what was going on, well, that was true in Adam. Uh, Adam and Eve had that relationship with God, but they fell. And the world got worse and worse and worse and worse until God said, I have had it not just up to here, but up to here. And I'm going to do away with everything. But there's one man that seems to follow me. Noah. And so I'm going to keep Noah. And I'm going to allow his family to live. But I'm going to destroy all of my creation. And God destroyed everything with the flood. And now God is beginning all over again. And he is creating the opportunity of relationship with his creation. 
but God is the one who does it. It's also a unilateral covenant. God is the one who is making, he says, my covenant with you. I am the one who is doing it. I have caused it. And you don't have to do anything about it. I'm doing it. This is between you and I, but is solely for me. I'm the one who is acting. You're the, you just receive the covenant. You receive the promise. It's perpetual. For your offspring and those after you, there is no termination clause. For all of eternity, the bow hangs in the sky. Whenever God sees it, God is reminded, I will not destroy the world with a flood. It's an ongoing covenant. It's perpetual. It's unconditional. It can't be nullified. And Noah and his family and all the generations after him don't have to do anything to keep God from not creating a flood. God will do it. He will not do it, rather. God will not flood the earth. It's unconditional. And it's universal. It's for every creature that is living. Everything that came out of the ark. Noah, his family, and every animal that came out of the covenant, or came out of the ark, receives this promise. Uh, all of them get the benefit of this covenant. And it's fixed and binding. I now have established this covenant. It's done. It's fixed. It's permanent. It's binding. I'll never change it. It's completed. You don't have to do anything about it, and I'll never change anything about it. Um, I'll never revoke it. And it's permanent. Never again, we hear him say. Never again. Never again will I cause the destruction of the earth with a flood. Put a little caveat there. God doesn't promise that he won't destroy the earth any other way. Just not with a flood. Keep that in mind. It's not saying that God will not destroy and bring judgment on the earth again. He just won't do it through a flood. So, we don't have to worry about it. So, I know around here you've had a times where the waters have gotten high. Um, Shirley's had it uh, out there at Ouija, uh, and the waters get high. You've had it here in Powell. I, at least one time since I've been here, I remember seeing the bridge down here on 7 uh, putting sandbags around it, making sure, and, and the water lapped over the one out on Main Street. The, the water did cross over that one, but, you know, the water's come up high, but it'll never flood to destroy everything. Don't have to worry about that. God is true to his promise. And the rainbow comes out, and God remembers, and we're reminded, thank God, that will never happen. God desires that we would have peace and wholeness and salvation with him. Amen. However, the Noahic covenant is only the beginning of God's salvation plan. It just says that God wants to have a relationship with his people. But it doesn't go further in enabling that relationship to really come about, the plan needs to progress. And we see that as we go through the other covenants. God takes another step. God says, I will identify you as my people, circumcision. I'll tell you how to live as my people, the ten words. I'll give you a leader, a shepherd, one who will guide you, a messiah, a king. But we still need more than that in order to really fulfill all of God's hope 
within our lives because we've struggled over and over again throughout all of history. People have struggled to live up, to be the people that God wants us to be. But God wants us to live in relationship with him. And so finally, the fulfillment of that comes in Jesus Christ. Peter tells us, for Christ also suffered for sin, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God. Jesus suffered for our sins to bring us to God, to pave the way, to make it possible for us to live and fulfill all the promise that God has had for us by his death and by his resurrection. If you go back and, and look then at what we read in the epistle of Peter, there, there are some statements that Peter makes in there that give a tie between Noah and Jesus Christ and how we live and what our life is like. Just want to point out a couple of things that are similarities between us and the time of Noah. Noah and we are in a minority. We're surrounded by a culture of unbelievers. Noah was the only righteous person. And God gave him the task of building an ark. And, and Noah continued to preach and tell the people, God is going to destroy the earth. But do you think anybody listened? No. They yelled at him. They made fun of him. They ridiculed him. And we today live in a culture of people who do not believe that you know, we, God is love. God is love. God will just love us all. We can do whatever we want to do. We can sin all that we want to do. And God is love and God will just forget it all. Not true. Noah was the one righteous one in a wicked world. And Peter challenged the people then and he challenges us today that we need to be a righteous people in a wicked world. We need to live according to God's word. Amen. We need to follow his principles of what it means to call upon him and to live by his grace. Noah witnessed to the people that they needed to change. And Peter challenges us that we need to be a people who witness of who God is and what God calls us to do and how to live our lives, that we are to be ambassadors of the hope that comes only through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Noah knew that judgment was coming. And we know judgment is coming. Perhaps sooner than we would like. But judgment is coming. And one day, will come on all the earth again. Noah and his family were saved by faith by entering into the ark, believing that God would make a provision for them, that they would be protected in the grace of God as they entered into the ark and God closed his grace around them and protected them. And Peter reminds us, that the only way that we can be saved is entering into the ark of God's grace, living a life of faith, trusting and obeying God every day in all that we do. Now, the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the only means of salvation. It is the ark of grace to trust and believe that Jesus is our Savior. The Noahic covenant was 
unilateral, it was universal and unconditional, but it was limited. It only pertained to the fact that God would not flood the earth. That's it. It didn't promise that everyone gets to go to heaven. It didn't promise forgiveness of sin. It didn't promise help and wisdom and strength to live in a relationship with God. It only promised that God would not judge with a flood. The Christic covenant offers a bilateral relationship. Christ is not just for us, but to be in us, that we can live in the grace of God, that God can be with us, helping us, giving us wisdom and strength to live the way God desires. It's universal. John 3.16, for whoever believes, but whoever believes, which leads to, it is conditional. We must believe. And belief is not just an intellectual acknowledgement. As James says, even the demons believe. Even the demons know that Jesus is Christ. And they shudder. They shake at the fact that he is Christ. But they don't obey him. To believe in the context of the scripture means to obey. To trust and obey. And it has an eternal provision. We can have everlasting life for those who live and grow in the grace of God daily. We're living in a relationship with God, then we have the promise of eternity. Years ago, when my dad was pastoring in Terre Haute, Indiana, every once in a while he'd get a phone call. And I remember one time he was telling me about the person called, and they, they would ask him questions like, does your church believe this, or does your church believe that? And the person asked, does your church believe in eternal security? And what they meant was, do they believe that once you believe, you're secure for eternity? doesn't matter what you do after the fact that you believed. And dad said, we believe that we are secure for eternity if we live in grace. If we are living in a relationship with Jesus Christ, then our eternity is secure. But it is not permission to do whatever we want to do with our life. It is a life that must trust and obey him day by day. Baptism is God's promise that his grace is available for all of those who will trust and obey. And the Eucharist, Holy Communion, is the reminder for us that Jesus died for us. He gave his life for us and that that is the means of grace. Every time we receive the elements, we acknowledge Jesus' death as the way of forgiveness for our sins. And we profess that I will receive this and will seek to live with him in me that I will obey him, that I will follow him, that he will be the nourishment for my life, that he will sustain me, empower me. Do we trust in God's promise of salvation? 
do we walk by his grace and obedience to do his will and follow his purposes for our lives. We have a covenant making God. Throughout the history of scripture, God has made a promise, a covenant, a contract with us. Here, we see that that covenant also comes with responsibility. We have to live in a relationship with him. We have to accept the grace that he has offered to us. So as we prepare our hearts and minds to receive communion this morning, if there is any sin within us, may we confess it to him and say, Lord, forgive me. And I receive your death and your resurrection as the promise of your forgiveness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And express our need for Jesus day by day. We sang it in two of the songs. I need thee every hour. I need you each and every moment. I need your grace to sustain me, to help me, to live, to trust, and to obey you always. The song that we're going to sing in preparation this morning is Trust and Obey. If you'll take your hymnals and turn with me to number 437. We're going to sing the first, the second, and the fourth verse of Trust and Obey. May these words prepare our hearts and minds. If there's something that we need to confess uh, that we need to express to him and forgiveness, encourage you. Take one of the pieces of paper, write it in, and when you come up for communion, nail it to the cross uh, and say, Lord, I give you this. I confess my need for your forgiveness. I, I give you my life. I sacrifice myself to follow you. I, I'm going to do this during this time to show that I trust you and I obey you. Um, but if you'll open up your heart and your mind to let God work in and through you through his promise. If you'll stand with me as we turn and say, when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word. <laughs>
Lord, we thank you for your promise, for your presence, and for the symbols in which you give us to remind us and to invoke your grace within our lives. Lord, just ask that you would fill our hearts with your love. Yes, great. Draw us closer to you by your spirit that we might truly trust you. And to trust your grace that you want the best for us. And to know that obeying you is not a drudgery, but a joy. A joy of knowing your presence and all that you desire for our lives. May your will be accomplished in and through us. To the glory of your name. Amen. If you'll take your hymnal and turn back to number eight and join with me in an affirmation of our faith. <clears throat> These words of the Apostles' Creed. <coughs> if you'll read together with me. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades, the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Universe, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. <coughs> 